we move to a presentation on Digital Sri Lanka by Mr. Arunesh Peter, Chief of Project, Information and Communication Technology Agency of Government of Sri Lanka. Mr. Arunesh Peter has over 20 years of experience in information and communication technology. He started his ICT career straight after school as a programmer of business systems. A diversified career in ICT has followed covering systems development and implementations, solution sales, brand management, system integration, project management, and ICT consultancy. He has worked for leading international and local technology companies. He currently leads over 40 projects in the Digital Sri Lanka Initiative, covering infrastructure, capacity building, citizen initiatives, digital government, security, and private sector development. His passion is people transformation, and his current slogan is transforming a nation by transforming his people. Over to you, Arunesh. A couple of things that you need to understand. I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, detail is a discussion that covers a couple of days. Uh, so let's not go into that. What I would like to do is talk about what Digital Sri Lanka is all about and why, what is the thinking behind it and how we've actually looked at the approach and how we've approached it considering the Sri Lankan uh, context. So, please forgive me, I'm not going to talk a lot about, I'm not going to talk about architecture also, to a very little extent only I'll talk about it, but I'll more talk about what we are doing and why we are doing this, because I think that's very, very important. So, uh, the most important thing is I believe that a nation has to have a vision. I believe that if you don't have a vision, you perish. That's a fact that is proven again and again. And, uh, and it's important to have a correct vision. Uh, in most cases, the nations look at different types of vision, but the most important asset a nation has is not its geographical location, not the, the, the commodities that it has, not agriculture, but its people. And uh, it's, it's actually very hard to know that the government has a vision that is based completely on transforming people, which again is very close to my heart, as I said earlier. So the vision is towards a creative, knowledge-based society. The government wants to have within Sri Lanka, have its citizens to have creative, knowledge-based capabilities. Right? It's not just knowledge-based. Sri Lanka has, over the years, delivered a lot of content through teaching, but not very effective, the uh, So how do we transform it? And that is by bringing the creativity in. So let me go on to the next one. So what is our vision within this, how, do, how does the ICTA actually do it? To give you an idea of, of the ICTA, the ICTA's main role is to be the advisory and the implementation body for ICT in Sri Lanka. Right. So the government depends on us for advice, direction, policy advice on ICT. Right. So how do we as an organization actually deliver the vision of the government? And that is by bringing digital technology in. So our vision is a digitally inclusive Sri Lanka, transforming Sri Lanka through creative knowledge-based society through digital empowerment. The word transformation is key. The reason it's key is we cannot, we don't have time to work. Sri Lanka has not moved forward in a lot of areas for the last couple of years. And therefore we are now currently playing catch up. Uh, just to give you an indication in the eGov index of the UN, in 2012 we were under that 12. Uh, in 2014, we, we jumped to 75, right? And uh, that is basically a lot of it to do with some of the services. But you need to understand it's how you actually market it and make it available in terms of making the jump. Now we move back to 79. Uh, so which is actually an eye opener for us in terms of what are we doing, where are we going? And uh, as a nation, how are we going to actually transform? So. How do we actually get this technology right across? So what we've done is we looked at transformation needs inspiration, right? You cannot do transformation by yourself. You look at others in terms of how have they transformed. So we looked at two very clear examples of transformation that we would like to emulate, but of course in the Sri Lankan player. One is Singapore. Uh, in 1948, uh, this, is a, this is a funny case study, but a rather painful one for Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka was the case study for Singapore's transformation. So 1948, uh, I think 1954, Lee Kuan Yew came to Sri Lanka, studied our systems, uh, took a lot of our brains also, 
the first uh, qualified judge in Singapore was a Sri Lankan doctor. He was actually this was told to me by an, by a Singaporean, and which, which made me very embarrassed and very uncomfortable. Uh, but they also studied the government systems, the civil service deeply, and they actually took some of our civil servants, took some of our educators to set up the education system. Uh, the unique thing about Singapore is the fact that they don't have a single asset except the geographical location. Right. So they learned the lesson very early that people are the most important asset that we have, and they develop the people. That's why they are the powerhouse they are now. Um, with hardly any, I mean, the size of Singapore is the size of Colombo. Right. So the reason we look at Singapore is they've taken the civil service and transformed it. And that civil service is a model based on what we have. And it's actually an inspiration for our civil service to say, you know, this is how the thinking is. If you look at a lot of the technology that they can implement, we can implement it quite quickly. The challenge we have is people. How do we make people think different? How do we make people be transformed in terms of service-oriented government? So that's the challenge that we have, and that's why we look at Singapore as one example. The other example is uh, South Korea. One, one, one way I keep people away from Sri Lanka is I ask them questions. Culturally, in Sri Lanka, people are not very comfortable answering questions. So if they know that I'm going to ask questions, and I may ask specific people, so what do you think about this? They kind of stay away. But in India, I can't do that. Because if I ask a question, I have about hundreds of you giving me different answers. So there's no chance of me asking you questions. But South Korea, why do you think that we consider it a model? of transformation. There is, there is a very clear similarity as well. So the similarity is a civil war. Right? Uh, and they had a terrible civil war. And they came out of the civil war. Now, they are world leaders. right? They are, they are showing all of us how to do things. Especially on the economics. Uh, in, in, also in education as well. right? Uh, this, is not, this is an example most of my colleagues don't ask me not to talk about, but it's, it's actually I, I'm inspired by what Korea did, and it's an inspiration for us. The word Korea has a connotation in the Singapore language. When we were small, when you said Korea, the word directly meant slums. Right? Well, look at them now. But that was based on Korea, actually. The word, they studied Korea, and they said, they thought, when you say Korea in Singapore, it means a slum. But now, when you look at it, you look at the inspiration that they give us. So we, we can actually tell our people, we tell our people, after a war, this is the amount of transformation that we can achieve. Nothing is impossible, as long as you believe. And if you look at the two approaches that Korea and uh, Singapore had, completely two different approaches, but effective, because they looked at the cultural context. Right. So that, those are the two countries that we consider our inspiration going forward. So some of the visions that we have, uh, I don't know whether you've heard about it, we want to do something called a megapolis, uh, which is actually the complete western province to be converted into a complete smart city. The reason being very simple, 60% of all services revenue is generated by Colombo. Colombo is not big enough. I think if you come to Colombo, you realize that they're getting more and more congested. That's one challenge. The second challenge is we need to give effective space for investment from other countries. By the way, Sri Lanka's competition is not local. We don't have a market space in Sri Lanka for us to actually live off and grow as a nation. Um, our competition is international. Right? So we cannot actually depend on a local economy to survive. Survival is one part of it, is to strive, is the objective. So ours is international. How do we do this? How do we position ourselves as an international leader in innovation? How do you do that? So one of the strategies that we have is to convert the complete Western province, all of it into a smart city, with eco uh, living spaces, with the innovation locations. We're looking at tech embassies, or embassies where countries can actually have a plot of land where the laws of that country are used within that specific space. So you can set up a technology park belonging to, let's say, India. And you have Indian law enacted there. Right. So that gives you a lot of comfort in terms of the fact that you will be able to, your investment is protected. 
So there are things, there are, there are processes that are thinking that are going on like that. So this is the vision that the government has and that the government wants implemented as fast as possible. So how do we do this? It's a big challenge that we have. And so we have a, a roadmap not set in stone. We also understand it's very, very agile. My CEO is a serial entrepreneur. He started, being, he started his first business when he was 16 years old. Uh, I come from more from a more formal kind of environment. I find it very difficult sometimes to keep up with him because the way and the rapid rate of change that he brings in. But he thinks. Every, every project that you go to him, he has he comes up with something added every time you go to him. So it actually keeps you on your toes and also gives us a different perspective. So there are eight pillars that we're going to talk about. One is digital content, digital society, digital commerce, digital government, digital security, digital legislation, digital connectivity and infrastructure, digital jobs and opportunities. There's a thought process behind all of it, by the way. We have currently, we had 60 projects last year uh, that we had, well, technically not projects, they were a combination of programs and projects. We have added another 15 this year. Uh, I lead about, with this year's one, I lead about 48. So, the reason I lost a lot of hair is obvious. So, so my job is basically, as I say, is to either execute the projects or get executed. So, I'm always on the eight terms of the line. So, let me just talk about some of the thinking behind all of this. So, if you look at digital connectivity and infrastructure, that's a foundation. So, Sri Lanka has, is, is, a, is a leader in terms of Cellular technology. We have we, we implemented 4G long before India actually did, right. and it's implemented island wide. But we have challenges. Though the telcos get up and say, you know, everybody is connected everywhere. When you go to the ground and other they are the ones who are actually on the street with every single person of society. They say there are certain regions in Sri Lanka. The only way you can access their voice is you have to climb a tree. Right. It's not funny because you have Gamanita falling from a tree, answering a phone call, and you know what the papers will say. So, so we, our, our challenge was how are we going to bring this up? When we ask the telcos, they'll always say, what is our ROI? They're not going to put up a tower there if they're not going to get revenue, right? So, the first thing that we decided is, okay, we need to push connectivity everywhere. So, it's a government initiative to push fiber to every single government location, including post office by default. It's a three-year project. We'll be doing 7,500 locations. The first one, we are, we, just, we are just finishing the final stages of signing up. They'll start rolling out next week. The reason being, we actually have an earlier implementation which wasn't very successful because it was only focused on government. And therefore, because services were not delivered in every single location, a lot of it failed. But here it's in focus on the nation because when we push fiber to every single location, we are going to be able to reach the, the cost of telcos to actually go and set up that are going to be much cheaper. That is one strategy. One thing that we also want to do is we want to give internet access to all. So the policy is internet access to every person in every location is the objective that we want to do. Right. The only way we can actually do it is is the reason that we signed up with Google Loan. Uh, we were the first country to sign up with Google Loan. Technically, we should have been well ahead of the curve, but we have an organization called ITU, which defines frequencies, which, is, uh, which has its own processes of approving frequencies, so we have slightly challenged on that. But within two years, the objective is anyone in Sri Lanka, anywhere, can access the internet. The third one is adopting internet. So to start that out, we have what is called a, a free, Wi-Fi locations that are already set up. We had a few challenges. The good, the good news about having a lot of criticism is the fact that people are very, very, very uh, interested in you know, technology because if they're not interested, they, they won't give you any criticism. So that will go up to about altogether about 400 locations, and people are, all, are already using it extensively. So we need to have people actually deliver the technology and also have them to adopt it. Right? Uh, on terms of global connectivity, because we are going to be a global hub. One of the plans is that we already have about seven different cables connecting up. We want one more cable connecting up to the same group through India. So that's being studied. Uh, hopefully within the next two years we'll have that as well, so that we have connectivity to the Indian subcontinent as well. Information infrastructure, 
we have a couple of major challenges. One is we have information silos all over. Uh, even though there is a legislator that says that ICTA has to define all of this, it never gets implemented fully. So we have a challenge there. So what we've actually done is we've got approval to have a single government cloud standardized, which is already being awarded, which has already been awarded. Uh, that's the first phase. So what happens when that happens is that currently one of the challenges that we have is interoperability, standards across applications. We can't, as they said, you can't force yourself on government institutions. So this is a subtle approach of getting everybody into one space. Right. Once we have them within, within our space, then we are actually able to define standards. That's one problem. Second problem is within the government infrastructure, people get transferred every three years. We train someone, we put him up as a CEO, three years later he's gone up going doing something else. And we lose that kind of person. Right? So at least from an infrastructure perspective, we have a central location to manage all of that. So that's a lot of thinking that we actually have on the infrastructure side. Uh, Sri Lankans by nature have identity. Uh, I think Indians, uh, you are still learning the, the concept of having an identity card. In Sri Lanka, if you are going to take a O-level exam, you have to have a national identity card. You don't have a choice. So all Sri Lankans have, 16 years and over, have to have a national identity card. The challenge is the digital ID. How are we going to actually have it? So we've already started the process of creating a digital ID that will incorporate uh, biometrics in terms of fingers, iris, voice, and face. A uh, bit of a tough challenge, uh, but it's something that the government really wants to do. Uh, that's one thing that they already implemented. Hopefully, we will award that tender by in another month or so. so that will come through. And digital privacy, because the next question that's obviously asked is if I give my ID, who's got, how is my privacy going to be protected? For that, we have already legislation that is already being enacted, plus, we have the public and private key being implemented as well. So I'll go into that later. Digital education is something that is very close to my heart. Uh, you all know the British education system was wonderful in its day. So there are a couple of Britishers here, so I have to be very careful what I say. <laughs> but it has changed, the world has changed. Uh, you have what is called, if I ask most of you, what do you remember about the teacher? Is it the content or the character? So what is the primary role of a teacher? So, First school was started, the objective of a school, the start of a school was to take children off the street. So that's character building, because you don't want people actually going the wrong, wrong way, not to deliver content. But we have become a society of content delivery and certification, right? not character. So the challenge is how do we go back and build character. So in the normal oracle, oracle of all information, teacher delivering information, the content to students, retention is roughly between 5 to 10%. In a, in a flipped classroom, where the, tea, where the student comes up, if we actually make a presentation, the subject retention goes up to 90%. Right. So that's one challenge we have taken on. And we have multiple approaches to it, because it's just not, it's not giving a device or digital. It is a transformation of people and teachers, and an ecosystem that we actually taken on. That alone, alone I can talk about for half a day, but that's kind of strategies that we have actually done. We are implementing digital classrooms across the nation within the next three years. Uh, we started the process of preparing teachers for training. Taps will be given for all A-level students within this year and next year. Uh, content is already being developed. There's a different approach to how we take on the content because we want to have an open standard for content. I will talk about that later. So that's the kind of transformation we understand. Because if you don't change the people, and they start, it starts with school, it starts at home, you're never going to have character in the long term. So that's what, we have, that's what we really want to focus on. Digital wallet and authentication, we want every, the vision of the government is all transactions should be digital. And uh, so as a part of the car, of the digital ID, you will also have a wallet, a digital wallet process to be provided. So that you can actually do your transaction using digital wallet. Uh, E-Liberacy and participation, uh, there's a huge project that is going on where we are going to the grassroots and getting them on social media. Very successfully, by the way. We've already done, uh, we, as a pilot, we did 80, uh, and then followed up with 400. We're going to roll up to about 8,000 in the next few years. So what it does is it goes to the farmer, brings them to, as a collective under the local, uh, the Gramen Gazari, 
they work together to address their problems using Facebook and social media. And you know, we have case studies where a person who used to do uh, small wooden uh, tools, etc., using uh, you know discards from uh, in terms of old trees, who used to sell out of payment, and he got on Facebook. Now he's sold out on Facebook. And we have entrepreneurs, a lot of them like that. So that's what we want to actually create. And future, if you have the digital uh, identity, you like to do our elections also digital. Imagine the, the, the loss of nations has to suffer because you've got to give at least one or two days holiday. People basically have to go and vote. Here you can do it electronically. It takes care of all of that. Plus prevents fraud as well, which is one of the objectives. So the education portal is an open portal. We are going to open it out for anyone who has content who wants to deliver their content to the portal. You connect it to it and deliver your content in. And the method of delivery can be defined by a separate, actually a separate portal in terms of whether you want to do adaptive learning or standard method of delivery mechanism. You can charge people or not charge people, that's up to you. But we want to keep it open because innovation always happens. And we can't always depend on Sri Lanka to be the most innovative. So we want everybody from international level to actually come apart. Government content, one of the curses of, of being under the British system is because they were so organized. They've got departments full of documents, which we have to digitize. If you look at the folio of the land folio, uh, some of these folios are about 100 different, uh, maybe sometimes 200, 300 transactions long folio. And each one has to be, has to be done. So, but we are in the process of doing it. We are planning to roll it out because we have the Right to Information Act. By the way, India, you, I don't know whether you know that you are the best type information act in the region. And you can actually applaud it because it's brilliant. Uh, we are very close, but we can't take the final step. The final step is uh, if you don't respond within the stipulated time, every additional day you are getting, you, you, you lose the piece of the salary. I don't know whether you know about this, right? Sri Lanka, we can't do that. I wish we could, but we can't because by law we can't do that. So uh, RTI allows us, we will demand information to be delivered. And therefore, because we have a 14 day, to maximum 28 day life cycle, if the information is not digital, uh, you can imagine what it will look like. Right? Uh, local language support is something that we are working on. I won't go into a lot of detail. We want to get the uh, device to be able to interact with the local language, both in terms of speaking as well as command. And of course, optical character recognition as well. Security is a major problem for us. Uh, we have different different enactments in different different government departments. But the worst culprit is the people. Uh, I think any security expert will say the biggest problem is usually the person. Because if you look at even America, if you look at the Sony intrusion, it came to a person. Not that person didn't know about it, but he was just not wise enough to handle it. Uh, spear phishing, etc., is something that I hope you all know what it is like. And uh, we are, so we are doing a lot of education of people. We are also doing a national SOC on the lines of Korea or Singapore. Uh, within the next two years, we'll have phase one implemented. The consultancy already has been given. And we should have it implemented ASAP. We already have our CERT, which is just a lot of the post-mortem and the advisory part. So I won't go into it. Uh, national digital certification, we already have partial infrastructure in. But we want to be able to provide all digital certificates to the telcos. So that is easily consumed and it is available to all. So legislation, we already have the Data Security Act. We have the ICT Act already implemented. The challenge we have is the fact that it's not disseminated. People are really not aware of it. Okay. So we are doing a lot of work on that part of it. Because our competition is going to be international, the number one problem we have with international transactions or international agreements is trust. Right. So how do we make sure that we are we are we are a nation that is trusted? If you look at a lot of the investors, they say if I invest so much of money and something happens, your court system is so difficult and we have come to Sri Lanka, etc., nothing is going to happen. Right. So the government made a decision to, to sign up on what is called the trust agreement. Where any organization, any, any governments that have signed up, let's say we take <coughs> Singapore and Sri Lanka, and there is a business agreement between both these countries. 
uh, both two or two, two organizations within these two countries. If one defaults, you raise the request in Singapore, and he gets prosecuted in Sri Lanka automatically. Uh, Sri Lanka is the first of all, was the second nation in the whole of Asia to sign up. Uh, I think now currently Australia is signing up, Singapore is the first. Right. That shows the kind of commitment. By the way, our, our legal system has been set up to handle this and also to be able to fast track. Right. Second one is on the on the Budapest Convention on Cyber Security. Sri Lanka was the second country in the world to sign up. Uh, we did it in six months, which is a record. One of our one of our experts actually sits on that convention now as an expert in terms of how to implement. <laughs> in terms of regulation, we already have a lot of frameworks already in place. But one of the challenges that we already have had in the past is because of different changes and different approaches, we have not been able to fully implement. So under this current government, we have what's called an inter-ministerial committee, which has the same powers as cabinet. There are eight ministers sitting on it who actually approve regulation and make sure that it's implemented all around. So that makes that we have a process that we can actually get them to meet very regularly and implement policy and regulations. I won't go into privacy, I think I cover a little bit of it. How long may I have for time? Anybody? Nine minutes. Okay. Enabling electronic transactions. Okay. Uh, so one of the decisions of the government is to reduce uh, currency printing. I think you understand the fact that when you print currency in an economy, it costs the GDP about 2%. Uh, so the challenge was how are we going to do this? So we can't take the Indian approach to that. Uh, so we had to have a different approach to this. Uh, so there was two things that we actually implemented. First one was uh, with the national payment platform that we are implementing, which is something similar to PayPal, where you can have any to any transactions. Uh, you can sign up with multiple vendors to actually store your information, so that you are not stuck to a bank. That's the reason why we don't say bank, because the bank actually controls a lot of the economy in their own way, so we want to change that. And uh, enables transactions to go across, and all government transactions, the moment it becomes digital, you will have to do it digitally. That's one standard. So it will force people to actually digital. Second one is if you withdraw anything over one million, which is actually being the, the law is being enacted, there is additional tax. So it's about two percent. So I don't think people would like the idea of doing that. Maybe that'll come down later. So that's the Sri Lanka flavor of demonetization that, that we are implementing in. You obviously can't do the same, same way that you may you'll have riots in, in Sri Lanka. But I mean, you guys did a wonderful job of it. So. I know there are fans and not so not so not, not so happy people about it, but there is an objective I think that has to be met. Innovative finance. The biggest challenge we have is we, since we want to be a creative knowledge-based society and we want to create startups, innovation. The problem with Sri Lanka is if you go with an innovative idea to the bank and say, "Hey, can you fund this?" First thing they'll ask you, "Where are your assets?" Right? I don't know about India, so I cannot talk about Sri Lanka. Or they say, "Bring your parents' house and come." as an asset. But these young startups don't have that kind of asset capability, right? It's a knowledge. That's an innovative asset. How do we create an environment for that? So we are actually working with organizations and even the national payment platform is being set up in such a way that it allows funding organizations to connect who actually understand this specific domain and are able to support. By the way, Sri Lanka does very well on the innovation side. Our only problem is that we are not as articulate as you guys are in India. We know how to do the talk, the talk. Our guys don't, uh, our guys are struggling in that specific area. We are working on it. Uh, we won a lot of international awards, by the way. Uh, we won uh, quite a bit of the Intel awards, Microsoft awards. Uh, but we, we have not been able to take it out. What happens is most of these people sell their innovation overseas and come back, because there's really no opportunity in China. Uh, we have a company that actually, very young company, that has done a helmet which analyzes brain scans, gamma radiation, identifies which locations are working. So, and he wants to use it for gamification. Right. So I said, why are you using it for gamification? He said, well, that's the market I'm comfortable with. I said, have you looked at stroke? 
the, the most important part of a stroke is the first three months, right? Uh, Microsoft, etc., actually creating products that allow the Xbox to be used as an exercise tool, where it actually knows what exercises and it tells you this is the exercise. It monitors it, but nobody can monitor your brain. Right? So if I can link all of it, I can actually give the update to the doctor, and the doctor can monitor you offline. You don't have to come to hospital. So that's the thinking that we need to actually bring up and change. This is the biggest uh, challenge that we have, but we are approaching it in a very different way. So, uh, video conferencing is standard that we're implementing across all government, uh, starting with 20. Across government workflows uh, have begun the processes. The, the vision of the government is any government service has to be delivered either through a device or from the nearest government location. And that can be a post office. Right. So to do that, since we need all of government connected, we are actually setting it up, setting up the standards so that the workflows, etc., are connected. Application standards are being defined by existing applications. And that's a lot of work. We have necessarily we have a legacy system sitting inside. So we are currently doing that process right now. Uh, we have national spatial data is, is a very key initiative that we have actually started off. It was started off three times before and it failed because it, it went to either under the land domain or even the uh, disaster domain tried to take it on. But because people don't like different domains taking it on, finally they have actually agreed to work with ICTA. And ICTA is the one that's actually going to manage that domain. This is going to cover cadastral information. Uh, so there is basically certified land from a perspective of public, private, usage, soil content, uh, agriculture. Uh, the, the potential is huge. Uh, disaster, flood levels, uh, what do you call uh, future crop management, market trends. So you can imagine the amount of uh, thinking that is going on behind it. But that's what we actually do. We have already started the process itself. The, the RFP will be out by end of this month for a complete system, a unified board. Hospitals, we are, uh, Sri Lanka provides free health care for all. Um, so, but the challenge that we have is the systems don't support it. Uh, so, we've actually gone from uh, patients coming and spending a whole day in the hospital to get treated to one hour. By the time he comes in and walks up with medication. Right? So, the hospitals that are actually implemented this have done. Uh, and uh, again, 45 this year, uh, sorry, 45 was, will be completed this year. 100 balance sheet will be started and another 300 over the next three years. That is the first part of it. The second part of it is uh, uh, this is basically capturing information. We want to get into preventive health care. So, the next phase is actually going and reaching out to the government, the health officers, giving them information tax, letting them monitor people. I think some of the challenges in health is 25% uh, of the top, that's in Singapore, in Sri Lanka is more. 25% of all patients that check out of hospital check back within three months because there is no aftercare. Right? So how do we put that into the digital perspective? How do we activate it? Something that we are really looking at. All government services have to be electronic. That's a long part, and a difficult part because there are so many services. But we are mapping out every single service. We already have a revenue license in place, uh, and a few other booking uh, uh, things like wildlife booking, etc. Everything is that, that's already in place. We plan to roll out for all services starting with the main ones this year. And uh, I think that about the last count there were about eight or nine thousand. But I think that needs to be rationalized because I think that that some of them are redundant and duplicate. Uh, efficient public service delivery, I think, is a must. The concept is that you should be able to get, by the way, our passports, you can get it within one day. And that's uh, So uh, that is if you want an urgent passport. Technically, it's about uh, if you go in the morning at 7 30, you can get it before 4 o'clock. Uh, that's the service that you all have, but obviously, in terms of your size of people and our size of people, and the demand is very different. Uh, but they have to come to a central location. So that we want to change. We want them to be able to actually go to the nearest post office, process their documents, and get the passport delivered. Obviously, you can't do it in one day because it has to be delivered. But that's the kind of service that we are looking at for all governments. Uh, we are going to actually do a kiosk-based service. 
Uh, we, are, we are looking at studying it at the moment so that most of the services that you can deliver through a kiosk, we want to deliver. That includes not only government, but private sector, well, telephone payments, electricity bill payments, information, uh, even requests for information. Or in request for services, we want to do through a kiosk. So the tech startup program is, uh, we currently run our own internal program called Spiralation, which is an incubator and accelerator. Uh, because we've not had the private sector really stepping in to start the process off. We've run it for three, about five years now and quite successfully. Now we're looking at handing it on to the private sector because it has actually been traction. Uh, we are actually working with the private sector. We are going to, I, I don't know whether you've heard of something called Makerspace in America. Uh, that similar concept is going to be used in Sri Lanka by, and we are driving it. Yeah, they are going to create locations for people to have startups where you can actually have a desk, uh, an innovation center, services, etc. delivered in a specific environment. The thing about Makerspace is the fact that it needs a specific kind of culture. Innovation is cultural. So we need to actually create that culture location-wise. All the, the problem that we have is everybody says, going to put it next to a university. And I have said no. Because I said, university is not the location. How in, like what they do in Singapore. But we need to create that unique, unique ecosystem. So that's going to be set up in all the major locations in, the, in Sri Lanka. We currently identified one, but we'll be rolling out for every location within the next two years. I'm running out of time. Capacity building. The number one requirement for us is security, as is in India. I know you guys roughly, I think, was the beginning last year when they said, your need was, without Digital India, it was 500,000 security experts, of which we had only 80,000. Uh, and with Digital India, you've got to go for 1 million. So I would like to know how you are going to do that, because we are sending to do this. Right. Uh, so we are challenged. So we have a target of 12,000 security experts within the next two years. And we are looking out to see how we can accelerate the process. Because it's not a person who comes out of university, we need a practitioner. How do we get practitioners out? And that's a huge challenge that we are facing. Uh, data science is another area that we really want to do. By the way, Sri Lanka produces enough doctors, enough accountants, but they don't think on the line of data science. Data science is not something related to IT specifically. It is domain with IT application in it. And I think it's just a small flip of thinking that is required. That's one area that we've been actually been looking at, that we're going to look at. There was, a, there was a huge outsourcing company that came to Sri Lanka and said, if you can give me 100 today, I'll take all of them. <coughs> so sadly, we didn't have. Uh, so that's one area. So capacity building, we identify specific unique areas. Where Sri Lankans, uh, we, don't, I mean, we, we don't have the kind of scale that you guys have, China has, Philippines has, in terms of being able to churn out people. So whatever we do, we have to have a certain quality level. That is, that's obviously a certain standard. So our target is to identify specific areas and develop that experience. And one challenge obviously that we always have is that we train people and they go overseas. I think it happens to you guys as well. Uh, and there are reasons for it. Uh, but we are, we, are, we are looking at how, and that's, what, that's what is one of the reasons that Metropolis is coming. People like to stay in Sri Lanka, but they can't. Because they see potential outside, children's education outside. So that's, that's some challenges that we have. Country branding, we've done quite well. We are in top six for outsourcing uh, BPU in the region. Uh, there are also other metrics that are going on. We're currently being studied by AT Kearney and, and Gartner in terms of the outsourcing markets. We do a lot of work with Gartner. Uh, we have focused on Australia and the Scandinavian countries. We're looking at expanding it into other countries in the next couple of years. Uh, there are a lot of companies that are already set up in Sri Lanka. Quite large ones like RR Gandhi, etc. in the BPO space. Uh, plus, there are also Sri Lankan companies that have gone up, like MIT and now because they got acquired. So, that's one area that we are really focusing on. Since I've got a lot of time. So, so, digital inclusivity does not look at gender or from where you are from, which school. Sri Lanka has a problem with I come from this school, you come from this school. Kind of. It's inclusive to respect of where you come from, what they generate. Uh, we have a lot of uh, 
females in the tech space. But we have still have a little bit of challenge in terms of perception because people still look at it in the old way. But that's changing rapidly. We have leaders also coming from the public space. So I'll start from there.